Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for today. We thank you for how your word has been washing us. We thank you that you can even make, you made it possible for us to understand your word. We thank you for taking us out of the kingdom of darkness and placing us into the kingdom of your dear son. We thank you for this ancient word that was preserved for us. Lord, should this word have been lost in the way, how would we have known your ways, your heart and your hand? But your sovereignty, your sovereign mercy, your power, your eternal power preserved your word. Truly, your word is settled in heaven and earth, and none of your word will pass away. Lord, it's a miracle that the Bible is still in our hand today because you are a miraculous God. So, Lord, we ask for clarity again today. We ask for understanding. We ask for insight. The Spirit grant, grant unto us spiritual wisdom and insight into this text. Today, we'll be looking at four verses. We'll be looking at this faithful church called Smyrna. The church that is in Smyrna. This faithful church in the midst of trials, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of tribulations. This church remained faithful. Grant unto us that we may know what it means to be faithful. Grant unto us to also know how to be faithful at troubled times. Many of us are troubled, perplexed with life, troubled with circumstances. Trouble with many things. Here comes a church that had faced what we are facing today and still they remain faithful to the head. Lord, please illuminate our heart to know what it means and how to be faithful to the truth, even to the very end, just like they did in Smyrna. Grant unto me, Lord, the release of your spirit for service. Grant the Holy Spirit may expand these four verses to us way beyond the notes, way beyond whatever I have thought. Spirit of living God, reveal to us the very intent in the heart of the Father, that by the end of today, we too will have this testimony like they did in Smyrna. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome everyone to this journey. Last week we looked at uh, Ephesus. Today we are looking at Smyrna. Smyrna is uh, the next church that this letter was written to. And how does this concern us? Just like here last week, it started with um, a letter to the church of Ephesus, singular church. By the time you are coming to verse 7, you will see he who has here, let him hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See how it's applicable to us, to the Church of Christ in all times. Same thing with Smyrna. If you, if you look at Smyrna, and the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. So the first verse is written to the church, singular, in Smyrna. But by the time you get to Verses 11, he who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It will start as singular, but the application is for the church of Christ at all times. That how, that's why we are qualified to read and apply these seven letters, because we belong to the church of Christ at this time. Anyway, we did a lot of work last week. Let me step aside before we read. We're going to read these four verses. Then uh, we go into it again, like we always do. But let me step aside and take some reviews from last week. Who wants to give us a review from last week? Who wants to give us a review from last week? Oh, I've missed Brother Hero. We have missed Brother Hero so much. Anyone? Okay, so let's go ahead today. So who is going to read for us? Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. Three verses, and four verses. Who is going to read that for us, please? Okay, let's go. Let's go. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things say the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcame shall not he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Amen. Who can remind me or remind us? Uh, the clue I said will help us to understand what is happening in this in, in, the, in the particular church we are studying. There's a clue that I gave last week or I've been talking about how we can understand what is happening in these churches. You can see it again in this um, the church in Smyrna. We saw that last week. Last week in um, Ephesus, who wants to give us the answer before I give uh, something, a talk around it? Who wants to give us that clue? Once you look at a, a, a letter written to a particular church, there's something you will see first, and that will tell you something that is happening in that church. The first verse. Last week, you saw attention on the lampstand, right? Lampstand, attention on the lampstand. Then you see the conclusion still goes back to the lampstand. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1. Seven golden stars and seven lampstand. Then when you go to the conclusion, you see lampstand. That's a clue that there's something that is, that's supposed to be shining in Ephesus it is no longer shining. We did a lot of work on that, right? Today, in the church of Smyrna, the first verse, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. Then you will go to the last verse. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So what does that mean? That means that there's something going on in this church that has an eternal value. There's something going on in Smyrna that has an eternal value. So you see that clue. So let's bring that into our reading of the text. Do you know that out of all these seven churches, there are only two churches that did not get a rebuke from the Lord Jesus. Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Pagamo, Philadelphia, Laodicea, I forgot the fourth, the seventh one. There are only two that Jesus did not rebuke. So one of the two that Jesus did not rebuke is Smyrna, and the second one is Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Every other one, five of them, got a rebuke in one way or the other. So there's something. Why did Smyrna? Did why didn't Smyrna? Why did Jesus not rebuke Smyrna? Why didn't they get a rebuke? Why? What is it that they are doing right that exempted them from getting a rebuke from the Lord Jesus through this letter? That's what we want to study today. That's why I said there's something going on in this church that has an eternal value. They didn't get a rebuke from the Lord Jesus. And what made them not to get a rebuke is what studying. Because this letter is written to this singular church, but its application, the application of this letter is applicable to the church of Christ at all time. So what, how is it that on the last day, on the judgment day, when we stand before the Lord Jesus, we will not get a rebuke, just like Smyrna did not get a rebuke. See, it's worth studying because this is our lifetime. There are only four verses attributed to this church. But you know, really, if I want to take my time, 
we may spend a month on these four verses, but I won't do that. <laughs> I won't do that. We'll finish it today. But you will see by the end of today that these four verses has, oh, it, it has eternal meanings that when we keep unpacking it, we will not finish. For example, let me show you five things that we can pick as a way of introduction from these four verses. Five things that we can pick as a way of introduction from these four verses. If you look at these four verses very well, you will see the history of how true Christianity spread at the first century. Just four verses, and you will see it. If you look at these four verses very well, you will see the history of how true Christianity spread at the first century. There is all in these four verses. Let's start. Let's, let's look at those five things. Then we will now uh, dive deeper into the text. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. First of all, the name of this church is called, or the name of this church is located as, that's not the name of the church. This church is located as Smyrna. Where is Smyrna? We've been told before, chapter 1, verses 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. The Asia minor of that time is Turkey of today. At this time, it was in Syria. So, Smyrna is located at Asia. It's not a Jewish city. They are not descendants of Abraham. Question, verses 9. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and they are, and they are not, but as synagogue of Satan, what are Jews doing in Smyrna? And why is there a synagogue in Smyrna? Smyrna is not Israel. Smyrna is not Jerusalem. What is a synagogue doing in Smyrna? A synagogue is a place of worship. A synagogue is a place of worship of the Jews. Whenever the Jews come together to worship, outside of Jerusalem temple, it's called a synagogue. To form a synagogue, you need a minimum of 10 men, Jewish men, not boys and not women. So if you say Jewish men, for 10 Jewish men, that means 10 Jewish men plus children plus wife plus family. So anytime there are a minimum of 10 Jewish men, a synagogue is formed. So what can we pick from there? What are Jews doing in Smyrna? That tells you that at the time of the writing of this book, you don't need travel documents. People move freely in Europe at the time of this writing. There was no need for visa like we do today. And that helped the gospel to spread as well. That helped the gospel to move there's no need to waste time. It's coming back these days again. Like we have the Eurozone. We have the ECOWAS, right? We have North American trade, stuff like that. At this time, there was free movement. So Jews can come to Smyrna to do business, to settle. In the process, the gospel was also spreading. That's one thing about the history of this of, of Christianity, how the faith spread at the beginning. You can see five of it in Smyrna. One. What about the second one? Verses nine. You can also see a large garden of Jews in Smyrna. I will come back to the problem of the large garden of Jews later, but let's talk about this as a way of introduction. You can see a large garden of Jews. It takes about 10 men to form a synagogue. So there were synagogues in Smyrna, which means in Smyrna, you will find people that already know the Old Testament. In Smyrna, we will find people that already knows the Old Testament, which means it's easy to start up or to spark off a religious conversation. Compared to a garden where people don't know the Bible at all. In, the, in Smyrna, there's a garden, a large garden of Jews. You find that in Act 19. Act 19.8 you find that what Paul, what Paul did in Ephesus. Ephesus also is a Gentile city in Asia. 
and he entered into the synagogue. In, 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 he entered into the synagogue. Can you imagine? There was synagogue in Ephesus as well, large garden of Jew in Asia Minor. And Paul entered the synagogue and for three days spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So it makes it easy for the gospel to also spread because through that, you can start, you can spark off a religious conversation. This was how Christianity spread at the first century. Free movement. Second, there is a large garden of Jews everywhere. So there were synagogues everywhere, which makes it easy to spark off a religious conversation. There's a problem about that, but let's go, in, let's go uh, a little bit further. We'll come back to deal with the problem very soon. Now, verses 10. Verses 10 says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to, to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into the prison. Who controls the prison? I want us to follow this logic. Jesus said that some people in Smyrna are about, are about to be thrown into prison. Now, so who controls the prison? Who controls the prison? Are you with me, please? Yes, the Roman government then. The Roman government. So, but then this the, the, the letter didn't say Roman government, the letter said Satan. So it's a it's a it's a way it's a coded way or it's a it's another pictogram because actually they are uh Satan, they impersonate Satan or something. It's an epitome of Satan. Yeah, the Roman government is an epitome of Satan, just like Pharaoh. There's a real figure called Pharaoh, but he's representing Satan and he was doing the bidding of Satan. So here also the person who controls prison is uh the Roman government. So, which means at the time of this writing, there was a recognized government. And that recognized go government is the one that put people in prison. So, you have seen something here. There's a, there's a high guardian of Jews. Uh, there's freedom of movement. And there's the Roman government. So, what is special about the Roman government? The Roman government were the ones that connected the road in Europe. To the Mediterranean from Rome all over these seven cities for the purpose of business. This government that threw people in prison were doing business. They were the ones that created the road that made businesses to move. In the process, that was how the gospel went through these seven churches. So technology created by the Roman government, was instrumental for spreading the gospel. See how the gospel spread in the first century? You will see five of it in Smyrna. Five. One, freedom of movement, no travel document. Two, large guardian of Jew, which makes it easy to spark off a religious conversation. Three, Roman government development, technology. Technology has good and bad side. For example, Zoom today. You know how cumbersome it would be for me to, at the same time, go to Oyoto to teach Brother uh, Rutimi and his wife, and go to Thailand and teach Sister Mabel, and go to California and teach Sister Soge, and go to Namibia and teach Brother Valentine, and go to England and teach Baba Deji, and come back to Canada. It's cumbersome. And go to Abuja and teach Sister Oye. It's cumbersome. But the person, the people that created the platform, internet and Zoom, they may not be Christians. But God is using that technology to advance his gospel. It's the same thing in her generation. Luther. Luther shook the Catholic Church. Catholic Church had held people captive for over 1,500 years. And Luther came and he was able to ask questions and wrote thesis and nailed the thesis at the door. How? Why? Because at the time when Luther was questioning the church, Printing press was invented. So what did printing press do? Printing press made it possible for Luther's questions to be duplicated, to be multiplied, to be duplicated and multiplied. It went viral, what we call viral today. It went global because of printing press. So what broke the hegemony of Catholicism technology? What made Asia Minor? 
to see this letter, technology. So what's going to make the gospel to spread at the last time? Technology. So how, how good are we taking advantage of that technology? We see that in Smyrna. These are the good part. We'll go to the good, bad part soon. Also, what made the gospel to spread in the in the in the in the first century? The, that's three. What about the fourth point? The fourth point: this letter was written to the seven churches in one language. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Tyrethra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. One letter in one language, seven cities. Even Jews, the descendant of Abraham, that speaks Hebrew, that spoke Hebrew at that time, were in Sardis, and they were hearing and speaking the same language, Greek. Unification of language made it possible for the gospel to spread in the first century. Same thing with English today. So we really don't have an excuse again for not spreading the gospel. Travel document, internet, breaks the barrier. Language, most people speak English. And you can find this in these four verses, four verses, everything that, how the God's Christ, how true Christianity spread in the first century. Now, the next point, which is the last point out on how Christianity spread in the first century, this was a faithful church, Smyrna. Smyrna did not get any rebuke from the Lord. Rather, something was said about Smyrna, verses 9. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. So this church was poor. Some they were poor and they were faithful. Contrary to the opinion that we have today, that for a church to be faithful or faithfully discharge their duties, they must have money. This church doesn't have money. And they were faithful to the Lord. Now, their poverty is not what makes them faithful, but regardless of their poverty, they were faithful to the Lord. What can we learn there? What we can learn here is that true faithful church was simple. No church building, no committee, no structure, no choir, no headquarters. Everything was simple. There were no complications. Simple. What made true faith to spread at the beginning of the first century was that they were simple. No government backing, no political affiliation, just gospel in their mouth. Common travelers. The gospel at this first century did not spread by giants, philosophers, by PhD orders, did not spread by well known philosophers, well known theologians. True faith spread in the first century by ordinary brothers and sisters in Christ who went somewhere, had the gospel, took the gospel back. Paul in Ephesus, Ephesus, Acts 19, met 12 people, ordinary people, and they began to form. By the time Paul was leaving Ephesus, Ephesus had elders, ordinary men. Today, the church has become so complicated and so complex, and those complications and complexities is what is dragging us down. We really need to be like Smyrna. Simple. Simple, straightforward, simple to the text, or simple to the work. Smyrna was poor, and yet they were faithful. Because it, that's what, that was how they spread at the first century. Now I've said good things about where we can pick five good things that we can pick from this text. But now let's go to the problem. In this text, these four verses, we could see how true faith spread at the beginning, five of it. Now we're going to look at two things, again, that is a problem to true Christianity and the first century. We'll look at the problems. At the beginning of Christianity, there were always three problems. You'll find it in the writings of Paul that they faced. Number one, you'll find a spiritual problem that began with the Jews. you see it here. The Jews want to hold on to Judaism. At the same time, they want to mix the gospel of Christ, or Christ uh, yeah, the teachings of Christ. That was a spiritual problem. And you see how it's a spiritual problem here when we get to that part. 
The second problem the early Christian had to face was a problem with the Roman government. You see it again here in Smyrna. So Smyrna was faithful, but two, three, there were three problems that always faced the church at the beginning. Smyrna alone, this small church, faced two of it. One, problem with the Jews. Two, problem with the government. And three, problem with the Greeks, philosophy. Reasoning, ideologies, the isms of today. But Smyrna didn't, Smyrna, Smyrna, the church in Smyrna didn't face the third one, the, the uh, ideologies of that time. But they faced two of the problems. And in the midst of these two problems, they became triumphant. Even unto death, some of them died and they were still holding on to what they believed. Ah, what made this church tick? What makes this church strong? I really want to know. And I want all of us to know together. What really made this church strong? The problem with the Jew, that's a spiritual problem. The problem with the government, also a spiritual problem, but a physical one. Jew is a spiritual problem. The second one is a physical problem. Still, Satan is behind, but it's a physical one. Government throwing them in prison. Paul experienced a lot of that. You will find a lot of Paul's writing. It's always like Philippians 3. Considering that then he was a Jew before, but he has considered how those things has done. But it wasn't easy at that time. For people who had practiced Judaism all their life, all of a sudden, a new gospel came and said, you know what? Which is not new. <laughs> the conclusion of the gospel came and said, God said, that's all over. It's been, it has been climaxed in Christ. It wasn't an easy battle. And these two things Smyrna faced. And we're going to look at it one, as, one after the other. So let's read this slowly now and see how Smyrna faced these two problems. Spiritual problem with the Jews and physical battle with the government. How did they face these two triumphantly without compromise and they were still faithful to the end? How? Because I, I want us to know how to be faithful in our Christian walk to the end. And that's why this text was this this book is preserved for us that we may see and know how to walk this walk to the end. And let's read it slowly. This thing says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Verses nine. I know your works and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those say, of those who say they are Jews. And are not, but out of the synagogue of Satan. Let's talk in verse 9. There's a word there that is going to open up verse 9 properly. It's called, and I know the blasphemy of the Jews. Of those who say they are Jews. There, are, there were Jews, Jewish people in Smyrna at this time. And how does a synagogue, how is a synagogue formed? A synagogue is formed when there are a minimum of 10 adult men in a place outside of Jerusalem. When they come together, minimum of 10, a synagogue is formed. When they are not up to 10, it's called a place of prayer. Acts 16, and Lydia, that's Lydia's conversion. Acts 16, I think it's 14. Acts 16. Um, okay. Acts 16, 13. This was Paul went to Philippi. Acts 16, 13. And on staying in, this, in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, he went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the woman whom we, we met. Now, a certain woman named Lydia had us. This place, there were Jews in this city, but they were not, this place, they were not up to 10. It's called a place of prayer, a place where, a place where prayer was customarily made. They don't call it synagogue because they are not up to 10 adult men. If they were up to 10 adult men, they would have called that place a synagogue. So there was a synagogue in Smyrna, because there were population of Jews there. Now, why will um, 
Jesus called what the Jews were doing blasphemy. What the Jews were doing in that synagogue is called blasphemy. Why will he call it a blasphemy? Why? Because Smyrna is a Gentile city, which means what brought them into the faith must be the exclusivity of the gospel. They never knew the Old Testament before. If they, even if they were, they would have been called the proselytes. They were not part of the Abrahamic uh, descendant. Now, when they come to the synagogue to worship with the Jews, the Jews expected them to know what, believe what you believe, but still practice our Judaism. That's why it's called blasphemy. Mixing Christianity with any other religion is called blasphemy. In fact, Judaism is the closest to Christianity, yet it does not mix. In verses 8, and the angel of the church in Smyrna writes, the, this thing says the first and the last, who was dead and who came to life. When we mix the words of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, with any kind of of religion. It's blasphemy. What if you know, there are other good things in Judaism? They care for the widow, they care for the poor. Why don't you just pick some here and pick some there? Whenever Christianity is mixed with any kind of religion, it's blasphemy. And it's not just blasphemy, it's a spiritual battle. Is satanic. Look at what Jesus said in verses 9. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of this uh, and but are a synagogue of Satan. Whenever anyone or any institution seek to mix Christianity with any kind of human religion, Satan is involved. See, Jesus writing this letter brought their ugly face out. I know the blasphemy of those who say yeah, they are Jews, but they are not, but I have synagogue of Satan. See, Judaism is the closest. The Bible is, is so sweet. It brought the closest and condemned it. So it can't mix with anything. Bible brought the closest to Christianity and condemned it. So there is no other religion that can be mixed with Christianity. That's, Catholicism today became very big because Catholic always adapts. They, that's why if you go to Catholic church in North America, it, their practice is different from Catholic in West Africa. If you go to Catholic church in Peru, its practice is different from Mexico. They will, be, they will have one central thing, communion, but many other things will be different. They will blend with whatever they met on ground. That was what made Catholicism great. Even Anglican. In Anglican, they have charismatic expression, they have orthodoxy expression, they have uh, philosophical expression, they have theological expression, they have about five expressions of Anglican, Anglicanism. Anglicanism in the Indian is different from Anglicanism in England. Anglicanism in Australia don't wear regalia because that's the method that blends with that atmosphere. They don't wear all this castle can go. Anglicanism in Nigeria it's different from Anglicanism in America. Whatever works in your area, adapt to it. In the process of Smyrna not adapting to what is working, there are, were already a large population of Jewish community. Adapt to them and make money. They did not, and that was why they were poor. He said, I know your tribulation, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty. That was why Smyrna was poor, because they will not blend the faith. What brought them to Christ was exclusivity of the faith, and they will not blend it. In the process, they were poor. I mean, it's easy to go to a ready-made religious organization. I just blend. You know the gospel? Okay. Go to CNS. 
and just tell them, I'm going to revamp you and uh, blend with them. You have ready made crowd. Wear their garments, sing their song. I know the gospel. I know the gospel. But you blend with them. You're going to make population real quick. Or you go to redeem. Yeah, we believe in the redeem doctrine. But, you know, I'm a Christian. I know the truth. The truth is in my heart. And you just join redeem. You'll be a minister within a short time. You will just become a big guy in their midst. Sometimes you preach the gospel. Most of the time you preach that doctrine. This was why Smyrna was poor. They, will ref they refused to mix Christianity with Judaism. And whatever seek to mix Christianity with any kind of religion, Jesus said, is Satan. The origin is Satan. To Smyrna had mixed the faith. They would have had access to other synagogues. Ready-made crowd. At that time, the Jewish people had political backings. They were in sync with the Roman soldier, with the Roman government. So should Smyrna had, you know, mixed the faith with Judaism, they would have also been in sync with the Roman government. They would have access to power. It would be easy for them to continue the journey. Easy. But Smyrna stood alone. Smyrna believed in the exclusivity. That's why I said at the introduction of this letter, there's something that was going on in Smyrna that has an eternal value. This is one of it. Believing the truth. Refusing to mix Christianity with other religions. In 1937, Babalola used to use water to get the crowd. So he really wants to work for the Lord Jesus. Correct. He really wants to work for the Lord Jesus. But how did he do it? He mixed the Bible with African traditional religion, Etihara. It was questioned that this thing is idolatry. He said, but it's not doing any, it's not doing them any harm. It's in this book, The Messenger. But Allah said, it's not doing them any harm. After all, it's bringing the crowd. Look at my answer for Baba Allah. Jesus said, it's blasphemy. What Baba Allah said and did is blasphemy. And the origin is Satan. Because Christianity cannot mix with African traditional religion. The people Baba Allah led at that time were already used to going to Babalao and collecting elements. So he just became the Babalao of that time. That was 1937. 1947, Celeste started. The, origin, the founder of Sele was a shofar, right? I read his, his story. How did Sele spread? Miracle. No gospel. The revival of Babala was a revival of no gospel. It was just give people water. Water did miracle. Crowd came. At one time, Babala will have 5,000 people. At that time, 1937, who will come with their bottles and jelly can of water. So there was a revival. No gospel. Of course, it became powerful. It became popular. And it became rich. But Samina did not go for that. That was why Samina was poor. 1947, Selah came. Why was Selah powerful, popular, and rich? Miracle. No gospel. Revival without gospel. Selah would go to a city and heal a popular mad person. Everybody knows this lady or this man was mad. Or Shafa will heal him or her. What do you expect? People will gather. That has started. If he wants to catch a politician, he will do something spectacular for him. Maybe you will become, you get to power. What happens? His friends will start coming to that job because they also want power. They want to have political connection. Remember, without the gospel. So that was how they became powerful. I saw another, I read another article. They asked Baba uh, Adeboye. The secret of church growth. He said, one miracle is big, greater than 100 sermons. One miracle is greater than 100 sermons. So why are people also coming to redeem? Miracle. Revival without gospel. The land is already idolatry. The uh, idolatrous. The land is already idolatrous. So you package your gospel in a way, or you package your kind of Christianity in a way that conforms with what they know already, you will find crowd. That's why Joshua Shema is always also blowing. 
mixing the Bible with what is already on ground. You will find Sema at um, Duncan Williams Church in Ghana. You will find him at uh, Redeemed Church uh, at Eboye's program. You will find him everywhere like a prostitute. Because that's how you become powerful. You blend with whatever is on ground. Very easy. All of them, the same. You blend. None of them is condemning whatever they made on ground. You just blend with them. Maybe Baba should help us to be great too here. We need to be big. We should blend with whatever is on ground. Once you blend with whatever is on ground, you have access to people, access to power, access to money, access to fame. But when you turn against whatever is on ground, you will suffer like um, Smyrna. It doesn't come with money. But it has an eternal value. Smyrna turned against Judaism, the religion that was on ground. That's an advantage. They were everywhere. In, in Ephesus, there were synagogue. In Smyrna, there were synagogue. You will even find synagogue in the next church we are going to. They are everywhere. Easy. Just blend with them. You have access. If you are the pastor, and you have you have blended your faith with Judaism. You they'll be calling you here and there to teach, and you get honorarium. You will be fat. Your pocket will be fat just like that. But Smyrna was faithful to the words of Him that was first and last. Whoever is faithful to the words of Christ will not mix Christianity with any other kind of religion. In the process, Smyrna became poor. So how did Smyrna fight this battle that made them to be faithful? They were ready to be poor. If being poor is the way forward, then so be it. So Smyrna was ready to be poor, even to the point of death. See what Jesus said to them. Do not fear of those things which you are about to suffer, for indeed the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested, and that and you will have tribulation for uh, 10 days, be faithful unto death, even till to so at what point should we stop being faithful to the Lord Jesus to the end? At what point should we stop mixing? Should we stop at what point should we stop being faithful to the Lord Jesus? To the end. I love the fact that we are studying this book at this time. I know the Lord is doing something in our lives and our midst. He's preparing us for something that we will know later on. We don't know it fully now. Things are going to come our way that will demand us to be faithful to the end. Because there's something about the Christian faith. It doesn't end here. He who has here, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That is, there's something about the Christian faith that doesn't end here. We shouldn't forget that. Sometimes we forget that because of an environment, because of the pressure, because of the things we are also suffering at a particular time. We forget. It's all right. We are human beings. But a true fellowship reminds us about that, that the hope of a Christian does not end here and now. And I think that was what Spina was putting their eyes on, rather than sub submit to the pleasure or temporary pleasure of the moment, rather than joining the Judaizers of that moment that Paul called motulators or Paul called them dogs. Philippians 3, 1 to 10. Paul called them dogs, mutilators. Those who seek to mix Christianity, they are not from God. What else can we mix Christianity with? And that's the age we are going to right now. All road is leading back to Rome. Everybody's, there's a kind of false unity now. It's difficult to say what is truth again, isn't it? What exactly is truth? Can we stand on what is the truth? No more truth. If God gives us grace, by God's grace, the next camp, Baba and I will do at the, in Nigeria is going to be titled, What is Truth? What, is, what exactly is the truth? And we're going to be looking at it from the book of John, Gospel of John. By God's grace, if God gives us opportunity, what is the truth? The, land is, the, the line is blurry now. It's blurring. 
Back in the days, in the early days of Christianity, even in our country, Nigeria, it's clear you can always say Christian who is not a Christian. Today, it's, it's, the line is blurry. It's blurry. It's, it's finished. It's gray. It's no longer white or black. Because when the line is blurring, there's money, there's fame, there's power, there's political affiliation. And that's how you can have crowd to blow the line. Christianity cannot mix. The teachings of Christ are exclusive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It's blurring right now. They say that's too narrow. It's narrow-minded. We have to expand that text, you know. We can't say that it's being unfair to all other religions. Christianity cannot stand, stand side by side other religion. Our unity is to truth. You know, you have to love. Love. Love is a new truth right now. Yes. First Corinthians 13. Love rejoice in truth. This book is preparing us for the age that we live in. That was Valala Oshofa Adeboye. All about Medibeka Hedi, Christian science. Christian science teaches the power of words. So, Christian and science. is Now you see, you don't mix Christianity, Christian and science, which is neither Christianity nor science, because science can be scientific principles, can work with Christianity principles. They are not against themselves, but they are not the same. Because scientific principles work with uh, observation, observable, measurable, repeatable. How do we repeat? How do we repeat? Calvary, when Jesus died. How do we go back to Genesis to see, to scientifically observe creation? So, Christianity is based on historical account. Science is based on, based on observable, measurable, and repeatable steps or procedures. So, they are not against, they are both in search of truth. But this is in search of material truth. This is in search of eternal truth. Different parameters. So why how then do we say Christian science? And what Christian science teaches is the power of words. Words are things. So when you are sick, you say you are not sick. It came from Medibika Hedi, Christian science. Now you see what Jesus said, that kind of blasphemy that mixes Christianity with other things, he said is from the devil. Number one is blasphemy. It's accusing God. Number two, the origin of that blasphemy is the devil. The words are things. When you are sick, you say you are not sick. That was, that's the thing that came to word of faith. What about Christian psychology? Yes, after Medibika Hedi, who propagated Christian science, you also have Christian psychology. Can you imagine? Christian psychology, mixing Christianity. Christian psychology. Christianity seeks to talk about eternal life. Psychology studies the soul of man. So they are not the same. But how then do we bring Christian psychology together? By the way, the propagators of psychology, Young, Sigmund Freud, the methods, the principles that they derived for their method for, or for the, that they put in a textbook came from memory regression, which means they use shamanic method to regress their patient. And in the process, they extracted things using Babalawo method, shaman, shamanic method. And that was what they put in the textbook. Now, some people came and now want to blend that kind of method with Christian faith. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1, in the later times, some will depart from the faith. They will give it to seducing spirit and doctrine of demon. That doctrine of demon is shamanic method. That Sigmund Freud and his, met and his people, German, German medical doctors, used to extract messages from the astral world. And they wrote it in a textbook. Now they brought it to Christianity, Christian psychology. And their, propag their, their, their propagators, that you find PME, positive mental attitude, or positive confession. So you have you speak life into your, into your business. Same, similar to Christian science. See, old lie in a new dress. It's still a lie. Old lie in a new jacket is still a lie. It's still Christian science that came into PME, Christian psychology. It's still the same thing. Those ones believe words are things, Christian science. 
Christian psychology believes thoughts are things. You find people like Samadhi, I mean, teaching that mixing Christian and psychology, Christianity and psychology together. Thoughts are things. Words are things. Jesus said to the Smyrna, whenever Christianity is mixed, the closest is Judaism, is blasphemy. How much more for far Christian science and Christian psychology? Christian, there's another one, Christian mysticism. That is the ability to alter reality at will through the use of techniques or method. The ability to alter reality at will through the use of technique or method. So Adebaye lifted up a rod. Look at the rod and pray. That is Christian mysticism. Using the, the ability to alter reality at will through the use of technique or method. Or we you depot giving oil. When you use that oil, it will alter reality. And the technique is oil. Even selling using water, ability to alter reality at will. And the technique, and through the use of technique, Jesus said, whatever mixes Christianity is blasphemy, at the same time, is from the devil. Now, word of faith now combined all of them. Word of faith teaches power of words, power of thoughts, power of altering reality at will through the use of techniques. You see that we are really in a big world, in a big world that many things we put our head into, we don't know. God has delivered us, but God needs, God is going to use us to deliver as many as possible. Whatever seeks to mix Christianity with other religion, with other things, is blasphemy. At the same time, the origin is not divine. But then, if you stand against this established authority, it will cost you money, it will cost you life, it will cost you association, it will cost you friendship. This was how Smyrna became faithful. They believed in the truth alone. <laughs> I will ask this question, what has gone wrong with our church today? Why is everybody loving the church? Why is the whole world loving the church? Because there's no way we, we, you will teach and believe the exclusivity of the faith and your world will love you. There must be something the church is doing wrong. They're not doing right. So this text in verse 9 says, I know your works of tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but they are not, but are of are, are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil, the government, is about to throw some of you in prison. After this church, after this time, shortly after this time, about 150 years about this time, in this city of Smyrna, there was a bishop called Polycarp. Polycarp was a bishop in, in fact, less than 150 years because history showed that it was put there by John, this same John that wrote this letter in the city of Smyrna. And Polycarp was killed by the same government. So perhaps what Jesus is writing here, some of it, some of it was fulfilled at the time of his writing, and some of it was later on. Because this, at the time Polycarp was a bishop in Smyrna, he was killed by this Roman government. And why was he killed? He was killed because he refused to say that Caesar is Lord. He refused to say that Caesar is Lord. And for that reason, they called that blasphemy and he was killed. Now, what does that mean? If you look at this text properly, the progression started from mixing the faith, but Satan has the greater goal. It starts from neutralizing the faith. Then he's going to come out eventually as the object of worship. How come Polycarp didn't say Caesar is, Caesar is Lord and he was killed? What that means was at that time Polycarp, Polycarp was killed. In Rome, for you to practice your religion, you have to register with the government. So there were many religions, not just Judaism. There were a lot of idol worship in Rome. You can see why the Catholic is big. Every other, all of those idol worship was accommodated. You see that they have a lot of saints, a lot of 
pictures, pictures, images, statues. They have consumed, imbibed all of those religions. Yes, yeah, okay, you are a new religion, you register with Rome then. When you register with Rome, the Rome gives you a license to practice your religion freely. So who gave you the permission to practice your religion? Rome. After a time, Rome now said, no, every other religion is blasphemy. It's now the God that should be worshipped. Of course, he was the one that gave you permission to be to operate in the first place. He gave them the permission to be a religion to do a religious worship. Then he came around and said, This from this license is withdrawn. Now I am the object of worship, which means the journey to neutralize faith does not end at neutralizing faith, is going to substituting the object of worship. So all these word of faith guys, all these CAC guys, neutralizing the faith, they are actually working for a greater goal of, this, of the devil. Because that was what Daniel told us. Daniel chapter 11, I think. Daniel 11. The place of worship will be desolated. That's what Daniel told us. The prophecy of Daniel. It will first of all start from neutralizing worship. Then when the object shows up, the real Satan showed up, people will not, people would have been desensitized. And that's what these churches are doing. They are really working for the devil. That when the real devil showed up, shows up, people will have forgotten because they will have been dead spiritually. You see, he started from the blasphemy of the Jews, then went to the devil is about to throw some of you in the prison. It's a, for a greater good. I was walking, I was going to walk three days ago, and I saw a beautiful church. Grace, the name of the church is Grace United Church. Nice church in a rich environment, beautiful. Oh, I'm like, wow, this is good. Nice architecture. All of a sudden, on the signboard, a screen that shows the activities of the church, it just turned to rainbow. It just turned to rainbow. I'm like, what? In a place called church, rainbow. You know what that means, right? In a place called church, it just turned to rainbow. That's it. That's what is happening. Neutralize the faith first. When faith is neutralized, the real object will show up. That's what is happening here. The first, it said that it's, the blasphemy of the Jews came. Then the real object, since Caesar is Lord. That was why we have this writing in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10, that word of faith people turn to confession. Romans 10 10. If you shall confess, confess with your mouth. Romans 10 10. For with the heart one believes and unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verses 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved for what? What is happening here is death. Those who are saying Jesus is Lord here, inversely they are saying Caesar is not Lord. And the consequence of that statement is death. Today, they turn this place to confession, positive confession. You confess your car, you confess your house. It's an insult on the saint that died in, in the book of Romans. This is a thing of, it's a matter of life and death. Anyone that says Jesus is Lord here was killed. That was what happened to Polycarp. Polycarp said Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not Lord. And that was what killed Polycarp. Today, they turn that text of faithful Christians to Christian science and Christian psychology. See, they are working for the devil. The progression will start from neutralizing the faith, introducing blasphemous things to the faith. Then when people believe wrongly, people have false hope, false belief, false converts. Then when the real Antichrist showed up, the real thing that is behind the scene, they are not Christians in the first place. That's why when a new preacher comes to town, the one that is doing miracle the most, crowd will go there. So a video this week, the boy said something. He said, you know, at a point, it was sele, sele everywhere. Everybody was saying sele, 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 everywhere. Truly, in Lagos at that time, every corner, province, parish, those names was used by sele before. Parish this, parish that, province this, province that, regional headquarter. It was an, it was a, an, organ, an uh, Organogram for Sele before. By the way, he said, now he's redeemed. He says so. At that point, it was Sele, 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 Sele. But now it's now redeemed everywhere, every corner. The same structure. Sele was the one that started camp. Sele was the one that started city church at Imeko. They had headquarters. People would buy land. You would, 
you, people will buy land in that equator and that will be your, your, your joining place when you come for their program. That same script is what redeemers repeated. The same. Because on Shepherd is lit. The magician is gone. A new one came at camp. Isn't it? And the crowd changed camp. They are all the same. When the real Antichrist showed up, people have believed wrongly. When the real Antichrist that is performing signs and wonders, Bible says in Revelation 13, it will even call fire to come from heaven. People will rush there. Arome. People are rushing towards Arome now because Arome knows how to move things in the spirit. It will make people fall without touching them. It can alter reality at will. All the young people are running towards Arome right now. They can't see in between the line that this guy is working for the devil. But why? Why can't they see? He's doing things. He can make things. He can alter reality with the use of his mind. I remember we not we stand without touching you and things people will be falling and they'll be screaming. He can use his mind to alter reality. What about Lawrence Oyo? Lawrence Oyo can call down Jesus Christ from the right hand of God, the majesty, from the, from, the, from the right hand of the majesty. He can call him down to your program and you will start seeing Jesus. Really? That's why crowds are trooping, trooping towards him. They can't see again. How will they see? Because they have consumed the blasphemy of redeem, the blasphemy of winners, the blasphemy of Christ embassy, the blasphemy of CAC. So the real Antichrist, when he showed up, shows up, they can't know. You see that I said this story, this lesson that is in these four verses, it's a, it's a lesson of a lifetime. Please don't forget this. Christianity, the gospel of Christ, the truth of Christ, it is stand alone. It doesn't mix with African paganistic religion. It doesn't mix with, mix with Western civilization or philosophy. It doesn't mix with the Eastern, uh, Eastern religion, meditation, yoga. There's Christian yoga now, Christian yoga. Can you imagine? Christian yoga. So churches are now in Canada have yoga or under the auditorium. So in the evening, you can come from for Christian yoga. Can you imagine? Christian yoga. Mixing Christianity with other religion is blasphemy and the origin is from the devil. In conclusion, what, what, what can I learn from this? From Smyrna? Number one, what I can learn from Smyrna, I see the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty of God. This in verse 10, do not fear, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison. The devil, the Roman government, the ones that built the road network, the ones that created the road that led to the Mediterranean part, Turkey, Pagamos, and Co. They were still doing the work of God and they, they did not know. They were persecuting the church, but they were the ones that made the church to spread and they did not know. They created business routes. They did not know they were working for God. So don't be afraid, brothers and sisters. Don't be afraid of your children in the area, in the realm of rainbow, gay, homosexual. God is sovereign. In the midst of the wrath of man, God is still at work. So don't be afraid of the times that we live in. Don't be afraid. The same Roman government that threw Paul in the prison. In that prison, he wrote the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, the book of Philemon, in the same prison. Four solid New Testament books. If all you know is the book of Ephesians, which is the same with the book of Colossians, you will be a very good Christian because that book went to the back Genesis and, and went to the front Genesis and went back to the, went to the back Revelation. All you need to know about Christian faith is in that one book. Ephesians, repeated again in Colossians. It was in incarceration that Paul, so they put him in prison, they were protecting him and they were feeding him. So he had time to free his mind, to write what God wanted him to write. So God is sovereign over all. The Roman government that was to throw them in prison, that created the road network, were also working for God without knowing. The God is sovereign. Don't be afraid of the times that we live in. God 
is sovereign. Number two, what can I learn from this? Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death. Ah, Jesus said, be faithful unto death. Yes, because the death of a believer is not a loss to God. Our journey does not end here. Don't be afraid. The death of a believer is not a loss to God. Look at verses 11. He who, he who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who overcomes shall not be ought by the second death. They can kill the first death. Man can kill. But only God has the power over the second death. So do not be afraid. Whatever loss we incur as a result of our faithfulness to the Lord Jesus cannot be compared with what awaits us at the end. So in the process, uh, Spina was, was poor, right? They were poor. But Christ said, you are rich. Rich in what? They were poor, but Christ said, you are rich. So whatever we lose in the process, whatever loss we incur in the process of being faithful to the Lord Jesus cannot be compared with what awaits us. If our hope is only of this life, of this world, we are of all men most miserable. Whatever loss, even the loss of life, it doesn't mean we should go do stupid things and kill ourselves, but things that are beyond our control, like Polycarp. Polycarp was killed because he, was, he won't say Caesar is Lord. The, it was a bishop in Smyrna. He was killed because he won't say Caesar is Lord. But in that, he was killed for his faith. He lost his life for his faith. But what I wait Polycarp cannot be compared with what he has lost. It doesn't mean that we should go do stupid things. That's called presumptuous. We don't presuppose God. God is powerful to save from all trouble. But it is foolishness to put yourself in one. There are two different things. That was what Satan wanted Jesus Christ to do in Matthew 4. You jump. Why should you jump? Who's, where are you taking authority from? He's not taking authority from Satan. Of course, he, stepped, he, he walked on water. He did not drown. He calmed the storm. He has power over nature. But he can't take authority from Satan. That's presupposing, presupposing God. It is we, God is powerful to deliver us from all trouble, but it is foolishness to put yourself in one. But in the process of being faithful to the Lord Jesus, whatever, we, whatever loss we incur, Cannot be compared with the joy that awaits us. Next, that I learned from this, verses 8. The angel of the church in Smyrna writes, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. The first and the last is Christ, right? Alpha and Omega. Mm -hmm. So the first and the last, that is Christ, is the beginning and, and the end. Christ is the entire focus. Mm. And that is where I see that Smyrna got the grace or the strength to be faithful. They were faithful to it, the first and the last. In being faithful to the first and the last, they got in trouble. Some of them died. They lost money and properties. But it is in that faithfulness to the first and the last that keeps us to the very end. I see, it says something. It says, he will, and who, he who has and hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. That's verse 11. He who overcome shall not be ought by the second death. There's something about saving faith, and that's where I'm going next. There's something about saving faith. Saving faith does not fold. Saving faith does not collapse. Because God saved us to prove that he's powerful. So wherever he's saved, we endure to the end. And that's the next point I want to the, the, the fourth point that I learned from this text is the necessity of trials. The necessity of trials. If you remember the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, Mark 4, he said, some people receive the word, the second category, with joy. And when trouble and tribulations or trials comes, they fall away. Struggles and trials are necessity part of our faith. Prosperity gospel seeks to remove it. So they brought 
um, health, wealth, and what again? Uh, prosperity. Health, wealth, and the third one, maybe prosperity. So when you come to our church, you will not have problems. You will not have trials. If I will not grow old, you will remain young forever. That's a lie. Because those who are pro pro promoting that, they are also growing old. There's the, the faith of necessity will be tried. I call it the necessity of trials. Smyrna had two problems. Two. One came from the blasphemy of the Jews. Second came from the government. But even though, if you look at these two trials, Satan is at the back. They are of synagogue of Satan, and Satan is about to throw some of you in prison. So the two problems that came to Smyrna has the signature of Satan, but God used it for his own glory. God is not the originator of evil, but God can use anything for his greater good. He said, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested. The trials of a believer is an unavoidable thing. Let me read ESV chapter 2. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Those two evils became good in the hand of God. I started my lesson with sovereignty of God. The road the Roman Empire made for business became a vehicle for the gospel. Now I'm seeing, I'm showing you again the sovereignty of God that yes, they suffered. Yes, they were poor. Yes, there was blasphemy. Yes, government put them in prison. But those also became a vehicle for which Smyrna was tried. God saved us to show that he's powerful. Truly, Smyrna will not break. Because what is holding Smyrna is not their decision. We are born again not because I choose to be born again. We are born again because God saved us. He regenerated our spirit and nothing can stop it. Nothing can unturn it. Bring all the forces of hell. A saved believer will not fall. Because it's God that is keeping him. It's as strong as the power of God. Except God fail, a saved believer cannot fail. So Smyrna's endured to the end because God is the one keeping them. God used the two problems that Satan brought to them to test them. Every faith will be tested. All of us will be tried. If your own has not come, exam day is coming. Unfortunately, that exam date has no timetable. It's coming at any time. And you will see that this church did not get a rebuke. Do you know why? Superficial faith cannot stand trials. There were no fake Christians in Smyrna. There were no fake Christians in Smyrna. They had all disappeared. If you want the Nigerian church to shrink, bring problems. Let the government come and Islamize the country. You will see that Christianity will shrink. Let there be a strong government that will cage the church. Give them trouble. You speak against the government, jail. You make noise on the street, jail. You carry the Bible on the street, jail. You will see the church, they will reduce. Real problem. When it comes, superficial feet will change. At a point, Islamic Bank came. They were giving uncollateralized loan. Igbo, Igbo people, Igbo, Igbo people. 2% Muslim. They began to change to Muslim to, to access the money. They began to change to Patai, Isaka, because they want to access the money. Superficial feet cannot stand trials. So when this trial came to Smyrna, it became a tool in the hand of God. God is not an originator of evil, but he can use all things to work out together for his good. Romans 8, 28. It became a vehicle in the hand of God to test their faith. True faith will be tested. True faith will be tried. But something about true faith, true faith is that when the trial comes, it leaves you better than when it met you. Prodigal son, when he had that problem, he came back as a better person. True? 
prodigal son came back as a better person. The father he won't respect. When the problem came, he respected the father. The father he won't worship. When problem came, he worshiped the father. Naomi. When Naomi was living, you never hear her talk about God, isn't it? In the book of Ruth. When problem came, she is more bold about her God. Problem left her a better person. What about Joseph? When Joseph, before the problem, his dream was me. I will, I will be the person. I will be the head. You will all bad. I, I was going. But later on, what did he say? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He became a humble man. Even Jesus, Hebrews said, the thing he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Trials may be painful. Trials may delay some things. But brothers and sisters, for God's greater good, trials will leave the believer a better person. And that was why Smyrna did not get a rebuke. Because trial came to purify that church. Trial came to push that church. The ones that remained were real believers. Superficial believers ran away. So there was, not, there was no need to rebuke them because the few of them that remain are true Christians. True faiths we endure trials. Lord and our God, the word is sweet. The word is powerful. Thank you for reminding us what it means to be faithful as we look at this church in Smyrna. They were faithful to the end. Even though it looked like the enemy came upon them like storm. When the enemy shall come upon you like a flood. We saw it. The blasphemy of the Jews orchestrated by the devil. The incarceration of the government orchestrated by the devil. Orchestrated by the devil. But in need, God, he became an instrument in your hand. Just like Job. The enemy came in your sovereignty. At Job. But Job ended up being a better person who was more alive, who is more aware of you, your person, and your character. Father, I pray that the trials we all are going through now will not be wasted, that these trials will do its job, will further lead us to know you more, to trust you more, will help us to forget all strength in self and give us the grace to trust in you alone. For those who trust the Lord shall not be put to shame. Lord, I pray for people in our midst who have fallen away as a result of the heavy trials that came upon them. Lord, we ask, just like the prodigal son came back to his senses, grant that they may come back to their senses, honor you more, worship you more. And for all of us who are, who are still here and standing, please continue to keep us. Continue to Help us to look unto you alone, the author and the finisher of our faith, that our highs may not be shifted, that our highs may be on the price, that our highs may be on the hand. Help us, O oh God, to be faithful to the hand. In Jesus' name we pray. It. Amen. This is the hand of um, the Church of Samaria. At uh, this point, we can add, we can contribute, whatever you have learned and whatever stood out for you. Please share with us. Okay. Uh, we thank God for bringing his word out through the vessel that he has used. And it is a uh, uh, it's very good that we we have learned a lot of things in the, what we have there. I'm sure I'm I'm sure that every one of us who is on the platform knows the sovereignty of God. The so that one doesn't you know you can get that one from uh, Isaiah forty to forty six. You can see the sovereignty of God. And uh, you know, one doesn't need to uh, look any further other than what God has said. However, I need to tell us that against the backdrop of what so many people say, Christianity is not as easy <laughs> as they say. 
you know, there's a very, very deceptive word that they use. They say, oh, salvation is a package. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. It is not a package. See, when, when they say that, you need to really understand what they mean is that uh, once somebody on the podium, the one they call out, uh, call out and say, anyone who wants to, because usually you see that after some testimony or after some preaching, and the preaching necessarily is not about the gospel. Necessarily, it's not about the gospel. I'm not saying all. So that's one thing you will know. That why what they have believed, they are believed in vain. And uh, I think I was discussing with my wife that uh, you see when you see those crowd, you can ask them one by one. Oh, why have you come for this conference? At least you find 93% of them. Okay, let, let, let me take it away back. 80% of them telling you about the problem they have brought to that camp. This is this is a, a very, very important. You need to really understand when uh uh I don't want you to confuse when verse 9 says I know your tribulation. You know, I don't want you to confuse it that it is when you have a problem. They have not gone there for Christ. They have gone there to have physical solution to what is wrong with them. They will never submit to the sovereignty of God. They will never. What did the Bible tell us? So those things will come, whether you like it or not. And therefore, he said, don't be anxious for nothing. But by prayer, supplication. Uh, make your requests to God with thanksgiving. That's what he says to us. Again, somebody might be on the platform here and say, oh, why is our brother seemingly, what, seemingly judging uh, all this word of taste, mention Kenyon, mention uh, Rebecca, mention all those people. Let me tell you, in this world, there's only two sides. You can be in the center. In fact, if anybody uses Matthew 7, 1, do not judge. You, If you look at the next verse, it said, with the same thing you have measured, measure you have judged. So it's saying that if you, <laughs> the same measure which you have judged, they will judge you. So it's telling you that what he's saying is that, yes, you need to be able to understand where you stand. First Corinthians 10, 11 say, uh, tells you, uh, I think 12, tells you that uh, everybody should test himself that he stand. What matters mm -hmm. most to us, brothers and sisters, is our soul. Matthew 10, 19, uh, I think, no, Matthew 10, no, not 19, Jesus said that you should only be afraid. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. But be afraid of God who can kill the body and soul into hell. What matters most? What matters most is uh, uh, your soul. If I Jesus said, what will you use in exchange for your soul? Brothers and sisters, this journey, this journey, in fact, that you are here, you are hearing all this, I can tell you that you are lucky. You are not, we, it is the Bible, which is the word of God. We are just putting light to it. We are not embellishing it. We are just shining light to it. So, don't, don't, don't look at anybody. Nobody. Nobody. Uh, and I believe that uh, he, our brother said that the death of a believer is not uh, a loss. 
Because, in fact, that is what uh, verse 11 is telling you. It's not a loss at all. And that is, uh, uh, I think, Revelation 12, 11 said that they do not love their life because it will come. It will come. And he, he uses 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 19. That we who believe, if our hope is in this world, our hope is not in this world. The hope of our calling is eternal life. That is what it is. If anybody meets, meets you and says something to you, uh, you will live long. I rather live longer with Christ than living long here. I rather live long with Christ than living long with here. So, the church in Simana, we have had the reason why they did not get the condemnation, which uh, the others were. So we need to obey God. Do those things that he has commanded. If you love me, you will obey my command. That's what he says. It's not professing it. Jesus is Lord. Go back and look at uh, Matthew 25. Lord, Lord. Open for us. I do not know you. They call him Lord. Lord, Lord. We have done this one. Your... He, did, he, he said, I do not know you. Because they are just professors. They are, they, are, uh, they are the speaker and they are, and the hearers. And not the doers. James 1. I think 22. When you hear the word. And you do not do it. It's like you have looked into the mirror. And take away your eyes. My prayer. Is that God will. As you go back. And you read this word. This just first verses. The Spirit of God will minister mm -hmm. live into you. Uh, right. And another thing that he mentioned, because he says, he says, those who say that they are Jews, what do you think that the Jews pride themselves in? They in pride Judaism. themselves in Judaism. In Judaism. And if you look at uh, Romans 10, you see what condemnation, verse 1, as a great condemnation, so, brethren, my my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. He's <laughs> telling you that Judaism didn't save them. That he's praying that they may be saved. Church activity don't save you. Hmm. Hmm. What saves you is you realizing that. You cannot save yourself. You can, you can, that it is, you, you realize your sin, you realize that it is, you need to surrender yourself to this, the leading of the spirit. That will be, continue to lead you. And you will not, uh, you will find out that he is able to save you to the uttermost. Uh, he has said so much things. <laughs> not doing anything, brothers and sisters. Not doing anything, just as uh, uh, Moses told the uh, uh, the Reubenites, the Gadites, in uh, Numbers thirty-two. Yes, I think Numbers thirty-two and twenty-three. He was telling them, you see, when 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 you know the truth, and you say, "I don't rock the boat," listen, what he says. But if you do not do so, that is, you know the truth and you do not tell those people, you don't want to roll. He said, then take note, your sin, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Don't think that uh, when our brother was calling all those names, calling them, that telling you exactly what, so that you may not fall into their trap. This word, Belongs, I mean, the tricks of this world belongs 
to the devil. And the devil has just one face, just changing those uh, uh, tricks from left mm -hmm. to right. From left to right. Acts chapter 17. The Jews in uh, Thessalonica, they said that they are proclaiming that there is another king, Jesus. <laughs> when Caesar was the, that is, uh, uh, I think that should be verse 5 or something. That Caesar, they are saying there's another king, other than, other than uh, Caesar. You know the battle in this world is about discrediting. Forget when they say Jesus' name, forget that. It's because Jesus, the Christ, that's what they fight against. They fight against the word of God. They fight against Jesus, the Christ. They could go into the Bible. And when they use it, you find out that uh, uh, what they are doing is that they are just turning the word, the, the, the word of the scripture upside down. Let me tell you, most of them are like the church in Sardis. <laughs> uh, I think it's a uh, last one. He said, I know your work. You have a reputation of being alive. So when you see the uh, the, the drums and they, they are beating, they are dancing, dancing away. Look at what Jesus said. But you are dead. Hmm. Lastly, the first and the last. When he says that, he said that's uh, something that uh, people must really understand. Uh, Isaiah 46, I think uh, uh, verses uh, 6 to 8, or 6 really, Isaiah 46. That is, the, so if anybody asks you, did Jesus call himself God? Say yes. Isaiah 46, verse 6. What did he call himself? Is it verse six? Uh, seven. Wait, wait. Verse seven. Is it seven? No, 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 no. One of them. Sorry. Uh, 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 I missed that. I missed that. When I find it out, I will tell you. Isaiah okay. forty-four verses six. Uh, 40, 44, Forty-four. Sorry. Uh -huh. so, verse six. Say, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first. <laughs> And I am the last. Nobody dare use that word except Christ. So it's God. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, sir, you see that um, the problem with Smyrna faced was um, Judaism, right? And Judaism basically is rooted in the Old Testament. You uh, realize that the man with the rod picked that from the Old Testament. No, uh, uh, my brother, you are, you, are, you are talking too much. <laughs> Where did this start? Kerubu and Seraphim. Uh, Where did all of them start? Kerubu, Kerubu and Seraphim. And Kerubu and Seraphim are the embedded, even Oedepo, even uh, Kumu, no, all no, of them. Oh, yeah. uh, all of them is white garment. And with that white garment, that is what they believe. That is where they so. And that's why I read Romans 10.1. Paul was praying for them that they may be saved. Mm. I mean, will you pray? Somebody who's not saved, will you pray for him that mm. he'll be saved? He said Judaism cannot save them. And Jesus said they will die in their sins. Hmm. So where was uh, to bring those things back now? First of all, it's blasphemy. And second, is working for the devil. The Old Testament is a is a shadow you have to see you have to see christ you have to see the gospel in the old testament that is what it is for not for practice no not for practice so not we cannot practice. repeat the office of moses because the man at uh, uh no, the office the, of the, the man on the lagos moses, about no. the expressway is the moses of our time all of them all of them all of them and this is, you see, sometimes you we provoke ourselves to say something because all these things, when you see it, uh, and you want to say things, people say, hey, what is your own? Leave them. But they are forgotten that this is not about anything. It is about life and death. It is about life and death. 
And we are not talking of the life in this world. We are talking of life so that you will not suffer the second death. That it is, that it is for. It's not for any other thing. And any one of us could die right now, by tomorrow, finish, kaput. But is are your sins forgiven? When you're talking of blessing, blessing, go to go to be the attitude. Do you see that the uh, blessed are the ones that have houses, or blessed are the ones that have uh, so many children? Go and look at blessed those ones that are blessed. Go and look at uh, uh, Psalm thirty-two. Who, what are those things? Who are the ones that they consider as blessed? And you will see Jesus referring to that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Referring to that, which is the most important thing. Let's hear from Brother Valentine. I can see that uh, you wanted to have something. Oh, okay. Thank you. It is. It was um, a good study. But also um, uh, sad to learn that a um, lot of the things we see around is just uh, we see and we hear is is just rubbish. So it's a call of concern, I think, um, for all of us that um, as much as possible we should uh, preach the right gospel not the shallow gospel that is prevalent around. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any other person? Uh, Sister Mabel, Bra Hero, uh, warm up before we stop the recording. Sister Francisca, you're no. quiet. <laughs> Sister Mabel is talking. She's muted again. Yeah. Okay, we are going to stop the recording here.